Hello, and welcome back to another week of the DP World Tour Picks and Bets. Skylar Hoke here, joined by Tom Jacobs. Tom, we thought the end of our streak could happen anytime, but we show up here another Monday morning, or Monday afternoon, and we have another winner in the books. A little one place, first place finish for Jesper Svensson here out of nowhere. Third place for triple digit Sam Bearstow for you. Let's keep the good vibes rolling, Tom. It's really good. Like, I mean, fortunately for me, I was asleep when Sam Bairstow was four clear after his 12th hole on Sunday. Um, and when I woke up, he was kind of, he, he, the chance had already gone, really. Um, but it was great that Svensson had come flying through. And, I, you know, the, the one person I felt for was Brad. I think he was on both um, Afi Barmer and Sam Bairstow yesterday. And then he was on Mackenzie Hughes as well over at the Valspar. So um, a little bit of a tough day for Brad, which is not usual for him normally he comes out the right side of those so um i won't feel too sorry for him but um it yeah look it's, it's a great run right i mean th- these are the sort of things you build a foundation on as we sort of said probably at the start of the, the year when when hashino won in qatar and then followed it straight up with pan drill in kenya like if you can pick up those wins early you, you know you feel a lot better about the rest of the season you're not second guessing yourself you're not um, you know, trying to go for, I mean, I don't necessarily do this, but I see a lot of people try and chase them by going for favourites a lot or kind of going for, you know, ridiculously long odds to try and get a big win, you know, midway through the season. So the fact that you can just kind of then spend the rest of the year doing what you've been doing to start the season has been so successful is really promising. So, um, yeah, you know, lovely start. Yes, for Svensson, we've been very high on him, haven't we? And, you know, he's already had two run out of finishes. He's now got the win, looked really good for it. Um, yesterday in the end I know obviously he's come from behind but you know to beat Afi Barmer in a playoff is, is no small feat I think he's a player that you know demands a lot of respect and, and Svensson took him down so uh, yeah really, really good really good tournament um, by all accounts hard to hard to flow with the time zones but um, yeah I mean I was impressed with how well we did and how well best I did really at you know 100 one yeah I mean Svensson, I've mentioned every single show or when we put him up, you were the one that kind of had a really good keen read on his challenge tour time. And, you know, we thought the course was going to fit spectacularly and it really did. I mean, he he dominated those par fives. He was 1,300 on the par fives, two better than anybody else in the field. Um, and yeah, I went to bed and he was 600 through eight, win equity of about 10%. Um, and I was like, all right, you know, let, let's hope for a, a place here. And woke up and just kept scrolling, kept scrolling. I mean, Barnrat what uh, eagled the last to get into the playoffs. There's a chance Svensson could have just won in regulation. Um, but no, good, good for him. Those are the crop of golfers. I mean, he's a little bit older, right, Jesper? Um, yeah, he's not. He's not like his. I think people. Twenty-eight. Get, I think he, yeah, he's not. He's approaching his thirties. It's not like he's a, you know, a spring chicken. But I think him and and Cassard are the similar sort of players. And going back to last week when I sort of said the reason I didn't go Svensson was because of Cassard being a bigger prize. Um, because you know, Arthur was fourth after round one, he just kind of fell away. He had a really bad second round and played okay Saturday and into a Sunday. But um, yeah, it just goes to show that it, it does take some players a little bit longer. And look, if you think about probably the two years those Challenge Tour guys, you know, one was on the periphery of the Challenge Tour and DP World Tour lost during COVID, right? Maybe we saw this from Jesper Spencer when he was 26, 10 years ago. Do you know what I mean? Like it's it just happens to be, a, you know, so I think having that patience with players is really important and really Svensson's shown no real signs of needing patience. He's come straight out and, and hit the road running. So um, yeah, definitely a reminder of what can come up. I'll be curious. He's 102nd in the world now. Yeah. That kind of game at some of the major tests, yeah. like if he gets into a major, like those are the guys that I end up falling in love with. You know what I mean? That can bomb it. Like the, the Del Rey at LACC type of thing we did last year. Um, you know, like, I feel Svensson, I mean, what do we have? Pinehurst and Valhalla on those tests? Like, could be could be fun. Maybe it's not fun. Of, it's one of those ones where, like, where you think, okay, let's not get carried away and think he's going to win. But, like, and that's not obviously not what you're saying, I don't think. But, like, there's no reason why he can't challenge a Norren for top Swede or finish top 40 or top, you know, even top yes. 20. Right? Like, we've seen players do that, first round leaders, things like that, where, you know, yeah, we've seen that from people like Del Rey, as you said, he was so good for, for at least one round last year. It just, and it doesn't take a lot, right? Like I think Wallison finished sixth in the Masters, Dietrich's had some good PJs, uh, some good major finishes, right? So th- these can happen. It's just um, it's just getting a read on him and is he the sort of player that if he gets a 
PJ Tour opportunity anytime soon. He quickly jumped ship, and you know you, you wonder whether they should just sort of stick, stay put for a year. Uh, I mean, if he finishes in the top ten of of the rankings, he's going to go over. But um, yeah, good good to see what happens in the future. I think he he really lived up to the hype so far. Yep, absolutely. So awesome, awesome stretch of golf for us. We have one more event before a little bit of a break because we'll have the Masters. They've done a good job at kind of. I guess a good job, I say, but letting those top players, there's not as many this year um, that would make the start. But April 18th would be the next DP World Tour event. So we have the Hero Indian Open this week back in action. 2023 brought us back to DLF Golf and Country Club. We are there again in 24. One of the most unique courses, I would say, in the world. Definitely that all that see professional golf. I always love the challenge. It really is something that, I mean, it's a spectacle when viewing kind of it because you're literally on the verge of uh, a quad bogey all the time. It feels like at this type of course, there's blows, blow ups left and right, single digit winners, kind of just a finicky test in some ways that um, I look forward to every year. Yeah, like I think if you shoot level par for a day, you feel pretty comfortable around there. And I know the score was 14 under to win last year, nine under, 11 under, like that you can't do that every round, but it's certainly sometimes where you can you can kind of get out with a with a sensible score. And I think Matt Wallace said exactly what you just said. I think he said every single hole feels like it could be a double bogey hole. Um, you know, I think Stephen Gallagher actually made potentially a triple bogey or quad bogey on on his final round when he won at nine under. Um, you know, it's no walk in the park. And I was speaking to Brad earlier about whether we're going to go back to the well with Afi Barmer and we sort of said, you know, the, the mental draining that would have come from the playoff and then to go into a test like this where, you know, if you make a double bogey, you could easily just eject and, you know, do one after the other and all of a sudden your round's done, right? So there is this kind of nature sky where, and it's going to reflect in my you know, in my card 100%, where I think this kind of plodder that always gets seen as a negative, but actually round here, it could be great where you just, you know, can you get two on the par each day and see where that puts you on Sunday? Um, you know, it could be beneficial. So that's certainly the approach I'm taking. I don't think you can overpower it. Last year, we did see um, players kind of come to the fore from driving distance. So three of the top five last year were inside the top 10 for driving distance. But they were Marcel Seam, who was fifth, Yannick Paul, who was ninth, and York Jorge Campillo, who was seventh. And they're not traditionally big hitters, right? They they just hit they hit it longer on that on that kind of tournament. And I think that's because of the force kind of layouts you get and things like that. Maybe that shows you that if you can be a little bit more aggressive here and and do it in a controlled manner, you will benefit. But ultimately, four of the top five also ranked inside the top 13 for driving accuracy. Four of the top five ranked inside the top uh, 10 for greens and regulations as well. So... It is an all-round test. I think you do need to putt well to keep you in the mix. I wouldn't want to be on someone that can't scramble, um, which might be funny when we come to one of my later picks. But it, it's, yeah, I, I think it's just a really all-round test. It's going to be unfair at times. You're going to have to just get over it. Um, and that's going to be the biggest factor, I think. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be chaos. Never feel safe. I think as much of an overall tee to green test as it can be, um, iron's going to be a premium t- totally. Um, in agreement, and I think a lot of the market or a lot of the the tweets uh, that I've seen so far this morning um, and throughout Monday are in agreement of what the top selection, at least on the top of the board, is right now. If you look at the outright odds, so you see leading the market, Rasmus Hoygaard is quite clear. Everyone 12s to 14s, Lahiri's 18s to 20s, Jordan Smith 20 to 1, Ewan Ferguson's 20, 18 to 22, Yus Lauten um all are below 25 to 1 the one that we are both siding with when i think of an absolute tee to green test somebody whose game in the traditional dp world tour sense was the best you know while his time on the dp world tour was was burn Wiesberger, right we've yeah. seen him now come over in three events on the dp world tour and it was what has he done in all three of those events just been lights out i guess all four of those events been lights out tee to green you know, last week at Singapore, his irons were flashing with him. He was 17th there, 16th in Byron, 21st in Hero Dubai. It just seems like classic Bern Wiesberger, this type of golf, golf course that he can do. And if he just tee to greens it to death, I'm not even worried about the bad putter that he has. I think 
as much as I said the putting will be important here, I think everyone's going to have the same sort of struggles and it's going to be the people that get there regularly that are going to have the chance to win, right? And I, look, I, I echo basically everything you said. He was sick and approached last week, 10th in tee to green. He's an eight-time tour winner, Sky, with three playoff losses as well. So can conceivably, you know, you give him an extra one, maybe, you know, one of those three is it's nine wins. He's played in a Ryder Cup. That's more than anybody else in this field has achieved. Like, I know there's... Yoris Nelson, Eduardo Molinari and people like that and some more veteran players that have played well but he is, I think, unless I'm missing someone, the, the most winningest player in the field and I think that will count for a lot on Sunday if, if it comes down to it right, like it, obviously the thing that people will point to is the fact that he went over to live, he'd also point to the fact that he's actually had injuries though and I think that's really important and you look, you, you rattle off the, the performances there, 21st, 37th, 16th and 16th, they're not finishes where you think, okay, he's definitely going to win next time. But it certainly points in the right direction, right? And and to me, as a player that is showing trend in form with the ball strike and added to it, I think we should really pay attention to Bernd Biesberger. He's 23rd here on debut. One and only time he played, he was 12th at the halfway stage. So for me, for, considering you can't necessarily trust any of those guys that you reeled off there at the top of the odds board, and I think for me, Joost Lauson was the closest, and I think I've given up from him for a little while. Like, I can't look at someone like Erasmus Hoygaard and think, OK, he's played so well in contention, he never bogeys, because that's not the case. And, you know, I, could, I think he could definitely lose his head here. Um, you know, Ferguson, I think maybe might be the next best solid shout. But, uh, yeah, it's definitely Pat Beesberger as well for me. Yeah. And I think it's similar to the, the Paul Casey syndrome in the sense that everyone kind of looked at that strike rate last week. And Casey played well, right? You know, but his number... I mean, we're we're gonna probably get on at 25, 28s here. Um, looks like best price still. Um, probably below twenty by by they they tee off on on Wednesday night, right? I think that's likely to occur. Um, but I think twenty fives to twenty eights, I'm I'm more than happy with. What I'm not happy with, Tom, is the fact that you let me bet Richard Manzo last week. It was case in point. <laughs> you you let me. You didn't stop did. me. We talked yeah. about exactly what was gonna happen. Yeah. What did he do? He was the 36 hole leader playing great before I had my dinner on, on Thursday night or, or what was it? Saturday night. Yeah. When round round three goes off or Friday night, he was three over four over through like six holes. He was like T 40 Tom. Yeah. It was awful. I, I you can't bet Richard Mansell. It's funny. Cause I kind of wanted to bet him this week. <laughs> no, of course we did. Everything's then- perfect. And then I just thought back to last week. I thought back to the conversation where I said, you know, maybe we should forgive him and and we weren't right to. I think I think the point you make about, about just quickly going back to Wiesberger, like the fact that he's going to be, you know, even if he settles at 20, 25 to 1, that's almost double the price of what Casey was last week and Casey had to beat Shane Nary. I know Shane Nary didn't turn up, but like, the, you know, I don't think we've got a Shane Nary in this field. And, in and the world beater, Matthew Pavant. Exactly that. Who continues to play well, right? And I think right. that's going to come into one of the later conversations but yeah i think yeah i mean look richard Mansell. i don't know what else to say i, I i'll take it i'll take it on the chin and, and take the blame but um we'll leave it out but i thought i pointed you into van drill to win the kenya open so yeah man i i just couldn't couldn't do it with, with Mansell ever again um in that mid-range i um i mean soderberg makes sense if you look at what he's been doing t to green right it's just been been phenomenal. Yannick Paul was somebody I was super keen on last year going into this event. Played really, really well. Hasn't had that same type of uh, form at all. It was terrible in Singapore last week. Um, Alex Fitzpatrick, I, I, you can make an argument there. Um, you brought up a good point. Would you go back to Afi Barnrat? I, I'm skipping most of the, the mid-range. We're, we're down a, a decent bit further. Is there anybody here that you thought was intriguing? I was very tempted to go back to Matthew Barmer. I, I don't necessarily know how you rule out Sam Bairstow, considering how consistent he's been this season. I, it's now getting to a number where you have to factor in whether you think he can win or not. And based on last week, the, the suggestion is probably no. Um, Fitz is always going to get kind of following just by his name value, I think, and the fact he played so well in his rookie season. I don't see it. Um, yeah, not really. Not really, because I think that a lot of these players come into that um, realm of quite volatile and I don't think that's what we need here so I think actually the the boring names that people don't want to bet are actually the people that that we should be considering this week and that's where you get the bit of value yeah 100% I think um, I guess I would say we, we scream boring 
with with a winner in which we've hit i'll just go right into right into there i mean you kind of made me once again do the double take for darius van Driel, right he's as low as 66s in the states if you don't want the each ways you can find him 810 to one if you want to you want about a separate top five which is still 18s one of the best values on the board for somebody when you show up at a course what do we want at Kenya? We wanted someone who's going to play from the fairway, someone who's going to be safe, someone who's going to just take it easy and know we're we're going to be on the greens, we're going to be in the fairways, and we're going to hopefully putt well. After competing at, at courses that didn't make sense, or I guess even missing cut in Qatar on a course that didn't make sense, Singapore to me wasn't necessarily the course that should have fit well for for Van Driel, who played 21st, you know, or finished 21st overall, steady off four rounds. Um just the price, man. What what else do you have to say on, on Van Driel? Yeah, look, I just think it's if we're right and it is just going to be this kind of plodding test, then Van Driel perfectly suits so that. You referenced Kenya, obviously, the win. 10th in, um, 18th, sorry, in strokes going T screen last week, 6th in approach, 8th in approach um, overall. So ball striking was great last week. And as you said, you wouldn't necessarily expect him to do that at Singapore. So 8th in approach, 18th T screen is a really good sign on the course that's a lot longer and maybe not in his kind of wheelhouse hasn't played here which you know that's that's one thing you would necessarily hold against him but that's the only thing i can see as a negative is like i don't know whether he's good here or not the the suggestion is he should be and that's what i'm going to go with i think he's been really comfortable i think he's dealt pretty well with being a winner i know he obviously finished 74th in the johnson work whatever but again he was 20th after round 133 after round two he's finished 21st since then and Look at even last week, seventy-two opening rounds is worst hole, like worst round. I think he's just really there's a floor. I think to to Van Drill that's pretty steady. And yeah, I think you know going wide to wire in the Kenya Open is a great sign. And yeah, I think he's over, overpriced, especially if you if you just take that kind of win equity, just back him in, in the basis of I think he's too big. You know, because I think most of it is I think he's disrespected the market, and I think he's just being disrespected because he's already won. So. If I'm protecting myself against that, I can afford to take that 110 on the fact that you just might go and win it again. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, I had brought him up because I think your next golfer, let's see, is right around the same same price. I, I'm going going kind of deep from from here on, um, Tom. So you don't want to go into uh, Simon Forstrom for us? Yeah, Forstrom is someone Brad really likes Simon Forstrom. He talks to him a lot. Yeah. Um, and look, I just think he, again, he feels very much like Darius Van Drill. It's, it's a good kind of segue, right? Like, I think it's almost the same goal for it. There's a certain amount of events a year where you think they can actually win. This happens to be one of them. He was eighth here on debut last year. He shot 67 on Sunday, which was one of the best rounds. It wasn't the best round, but um, the Sadao Open doesn't let you go and just absolutely bomb it. He won there last May, 17 under par. And look, we consider that a tough test, and he still shot 17 under again. We consider this Indian Open to be a tough test, but he could get to kind of 12, 14 under. And I think that's just right in his wheelhouse. And there's going to be certain events that he just can't compete at. It's as simple as that. He's just not long enough. But I think this is one that he can. And four rounds of level par or better here last year. I mean, I haven't done the maths of how many people did that, but he must be one of a very few amount of people last year that did that. And, you know, as much as one of them was, you know, a level par round, the fact that he did so well on that Sunday is really promising for me. So, he hasn't, you know, lit the world alight in, in 2024, but I think it's been fine. Like, I think it's, again, you've just got to factor in where can he play well. And a little bit like Van Drill last week is 29th at the Singapore um, Classic, a really good, you know, performance for him. Ninth after round one and two, 18th still going into the final round, finishes 29th, 27th at the Qatar Masters. Again, potentially not the most suitable golf course. And yeah, I, I think he's just outperforming what he should be doing. Uh, at those golf courses, now he comes to one that was, you know, perfectly suited to him. I think the, the price could look big. Yeah. 100, 110s are one he is. Yep, 110s. Yeah, form's a little bit trickling this year, but if you can nail the spot, totally. I mean, we used to, I mean, I guess the conversation, it, it, to me, we, we brought up Kenya, we brought up Sudal, which, if I'm correct, that's the Belgian event. Yeah. Is that right? Right. Who won at both those courses? Guido, yeah. Did Just, he tick any boxes for you? Because, I mean, last week was the first time we've seen him 
in a decent bit. I mean, he was steady 31st, 15th, 18th, 16th after every round. Um, TD Green was pretty good overall. I used to, you know, build up Guido for spots that were going to be super difficult. Like that's where I feel like he thrived in Kenya. He was not very good at, um, but I, I was quite close to going into Guido. Yeah, I just, it's weird because he has done so well, especially in France, you know, recently of, of those tough golf courses. It just still feels like to me, like he's a bit volatile. I like him when he's kind of got, you know, places to make shots, but actually when it's super tough, I can't imagine him being comfortable making a double bogey and just reacting really well to it. Um, so that is, that's my kind of negative on it. Almost like too stylish to win the Indian Open. Mm-hmm. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah, I mean, it hasn't been hasn't been bad. It's been better, you know, like he's starting to catch a little bit. But um, trying to look through anybody else kind of in that mid-range. That what, What's the number that you've got on Schwab? 70. So, yeah, I did skip over him in the range. Let's, yeah. let's go into Schwab. Yep. Let's go back to the Schwab then. So, look, he hasn't the... the the issue with Schwab, and look, he's 71, I think that looks good value, right? The, the one pe- thing people will argue, he's not won any tour yet. Like, he hasn't won the DP World Tour or the PJ Tour. He's been playing on both. But I think you've got to kind of look again. I, I think there's going to be a decent case study if someone wants to do it of what players were doing before that COVID break, what happened since, especially the ones that had to kind of go across two tours, right? Um, and, and Matthias Schwab was someone that was kind of splitting his time. So... I think there's a great deal of improvement ahead for Matthias Schwab. And when you look at 2019, before he kind of departed, he finished inside the top 10 nine times that year. Two of them runner-up finishes, four more top fives. One of those came to WGC. Uh, another one came to Turkish Airlines Open. He lost in the playoff. Like, he was a really, really solid player. And if he can get back to what that is, then there's no doubt in my mind that he will win at this level at some point. I'm not necessarily going to go on and do massive things in the game of golf, but certainly on this tour. Um, and you look at his recent events, four straight May cuts now, 23rd in Kenya, where he was 15th going in Sunday, 35th in South Africa, where he was 16th going in Sunday. And he was 43rd last week, uh, Sky, but he was right there. I think he was fifth going into the final round. Um, and I think you can just see that he's probably pushed too hard. He's probably tried to do what Svensson did and isn't quite capable of driving in that manner, right? He just tried to push for the win. And I kind of, you know, admire that in some respects. And, when you look at his course finishes here, fourth on debut in 2018 and 18th, uh, 2019, he was sixth going into that final round in 2019 as well. So everything about Matthias Schwab, again, he just fits perfectly in that probably a little bit more of an evolved version of Forstrom and Van Drill in the sense I think both of them, they all kind of have their difficulties of driving it out, you know, far away, right? But I think he fits the mold. The, the one concern, this goes back to the comment I made earlier, his scrambling is not good. Uh, mm. His around the green game is not good. Um, if that becomes a factor going into Sunday, I'd be a little bit concerned. But um, yeah, for the most part, I think he's going to hit enough greens and fairways that it shouldn't matter too much. I mean, the old Matthias Schwab would just rip this place up, man. It was, it was perfect. It's tailor made for him. I mean, we went in together, right? Or, or talked, um, or I guess Pat was the one that tailed it that week, where definitely saw the, those signs uh, of Schwab returning. So. Um, definitely can can see that. I'm going, I've counted down the literal seconds, Tom, until I got to bet this golfer again. And I'm going to keep doing it because at this point, the way that the reshuffle is going and the status is going, I, I just never confident when Nicolo Galetti is going to get any more starts. Like these guys have to basically win to, to lock up what they're going to play next. I feel like that's got to be, part of it i mean maybe they're they've settled in a little bit more once we get back in korea and there'll be weaker fields maybe we'll get that stretch that they're playing but what did galetti do the last time out right he finished 11th with a really strong weekend um and i keep good tabs here um on the mini tours and galetti picked up a win in the asher tour in between out in california so that's a you know one of probably the the better mini tours right now in the states a lot of those guys went at least the top guys went and started to play on the americas tour which is the new latino america mckenzie tour combined down there so some pretty good pro guys that were playing and they're like flavin and and bling who were both like sub 30s um in in odds board 
uh, for that first event on the Americas tour. So Gladi would be the favorite probably, in my opinion, on that tour or close to it, <clears throat> the way he's playing. We're getting him 150s here after what he did. Um, and again, we don't have the, the biggest stat repertoire for him, but what I trust the most is the PGA Tour stats. And again, I scanned through the field, Tom. He has to be the only golfer in this field with a made cut in 2024 on the PGA Tour, right? I think I think he is. So, and remember, at Waste Management, he led the field in accuracy. So, I feel like Galetti should fit well here from his game style. And just the talent he has, I'm going to go go back into the well. Yeah, me and Brad had a little friendly exchange earlier. We we were convinced you were going to pick Galetti this week, and it wasn't it wasn't a difficult decision, right? Like we knew that was going to happen. Uh, look, it comes with merit, right? Like I think we we spoke about this before. It's not like you just you just like a guy and you're just picking him. Like eleventh last time out in Kenya, it seems like a pretty good crossover event in terms of not maybe just the similar course, but just in terms of difficulty, right? Like I think it's a, the one way to look at it. You mentioned there about the accuracy at the Phoenix Open. That's going to be important. Um, I thought you might go with James Nicholas as well, but I don't know mm-hmm. if that one. Um, but it's good to have them both in the field. Yeah, I think I think anytime you can find a reason to play someone at triple digits, it's worth to me. It's just, it's very much as simple as that. I mean, I got I got three, I think three more now, Tom. So <laughs> we you, we've got you wrap through them, and I'll I'll just I'll just nod my head. Yes, I mean, so it is good to see Joe Dean also. If you remember, Dean was the one who finished second. He tried to chase down Darius Van Driel. Dean's getting another start. He that story I sent you or somebody had posted, right? He was uh delivery driving, right? Yeah. In between or like popping over to do some work. Like, I mean, it's it's tough sledding um when when it comes to that. So these guys need need it. Okay. Man. I'm gonna give the shout out to the audio listeners at this point, Tom, before I take a deep breath. <laughs> and we, can rip, we can rib through it. So you can find us uh daily fantasy sports picks and bets, the mix available on all different uh podcast platforms. We appreciate the love um, you know, on YouTube and the comments, Twitter. You can find me at Skyhook DFS, Tom at Tom Jacobs93. It's been fun ride so far in 2024, and your support, you know, goes a, a really long way in keeping us going here. Um, on the Mayo Media Network. So super thankful for the way things have been running and, and all the love that we get. All right. Um, I guess there's a couple more that, well, I guess he's now. Sorry, he's I, now. Think, I think like just before you go into that, like, I reckon we're, we're, we're quite modest, I think. Uh, so that pretty un- underselling the kind of run that we're actually on here. Like, so the last five events, we've had three winners. And the two weeks we didn't have winners, we had, Robin Williams, you had at 150 to one. He lost in a playoff. Rivetto was third at 100 to one, and Brown was uh, sixth at 66 to one. He was actually the 54 hole leader. And then you had Ivan Contero. Our worst week was when you had Ivan Contero sixth at 150 to one each way, like in the last five. So, and even last week, I, I, I need to sat the Swenson one at 70 to one. We had best at 100 to one in third as well. So, uh, not not to just sit there and toot our own horn, but it is really important to point out when it is going well and, you know, people will jump straight back on when it's not going so well or let us know when things have been on a bad run. So it's important to enjoy it while we can. I think, as I said earlier, it's really important to, for the psyche of making the picks going forward and, and to trust yourself in the judgment. So uh, really enjoying the run and hopefully that whether you're an audio listener or a video listener or a watcher, you've, you've enjoyed those picks. Yes. No. Good. Good time to recap that because it, it's true. It's been a really good run, probably the best run we've had in four, four years yeah. of doing this. You know, yeah. like it's, it's a stretch of golf that obviously at some point it's not going to continue, but like <laughs> our research hasn't changed, right? It's just, it's just, it does the dice, you know, show what you need uh, when you roll them out there. So a um, couple that caught my eye that I didn't land on. I, I think, I think DLF requires, or at least because of the finicky, I do love course experience here versus many others and we get a combined event right um where we're going to have a good amount of pga tour of india golfers who also been warming up with challenge tour events too so kind of a good recipe i feel like for some of these guys to be able to run up the leaderboard that's kind of why i land there but golfers uh either on the dp world tour or others that kind of jump to me you mentioned him last week, and I, I would have kicked myself if he won. Freddie Scott has been yeah. on a really, really good run. This course doesn't seem very good for him at all. He somehow led the field in greens and regulation, though, last week, and he was but, super long, but his approach was terrible. Yeah, so that, that 
I'm wondering whether, because he was really close to me. Like I, I said to you before we come on about the fact that I've picked four of the shortest golfers on VP World Tour, and I'm slightly worried that I've pigeonholed him in, in, in that respect. And I think if if I was to add someone purely based on distance, I think it would have to be Scott. Like I think when you yes. look at his form this season, you know, 37th at the Razzle Klein, but he was fourth after round one, seventh after round two. Uh, he was 56th in Kenya, but again, final round 68, second round 69 on a good good golf course there. 11th for the Johnson Workwear, 64 and 65 there. And then 16th last week, where he was a 36th uh, hole leader and just really, one really bad round. I think he's too volatile for this golf course. I think that's pretty much what you're saying there. He's not a great fit, but clearly rounding into some competitive form and, you know, maybe when it opens up again, you know, and he can just unleash driver at will, then that's probably when we should be betting Freddie Scott. But if you need it's to... It's hard. Get, Sorry yeah. to stop, but it's, it's so hard when, when we say that because he's not going to tee it up for another six weeks, basically, yeah. or, or four weeks. It's, yeah. it's like, it's terrible. And, and that's why, like, I actually admire these players that are coming back and, you know, missing three or four weeks and just picking up where they left off, right? Like, I think Svensson did it. I think Kassar did it to a certain extent. Like, the players that are just having these breaks, and that's one of the things with, like, Beesberger. I mean, he played last week, finished 16th after, what, five weeks off? It's it's not it's not a friend. I mean, I know they, they've had a couple of, you know, opportunities to play in between that they haven't taken, but not every course is going to suit you the best, right? And you, you have to be smart with your schedule and, and not just keep playing yourself into missed cuts and things like that. And, I mean, man's all five weeks off before finishing 11th last week. It's, yeah, it's tough. It, and, that would be one reason for Scott is just like strike while the iron's hot and maybe you can just overcome that kind of, it might even just be a stigma from us that like he's just a long hitter so we shouldn't play him. Like he, in the yeah. form he's in, he'd probably win the wherever or contend with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, missed cut the last night and wasn't he the winner of Q school too, right? Like he, um, he's, he's had just such a good, good, good stretch. Him, um, the other golfer who's a little bit lower than where I landed, Kazuma Kabori, um, coming over from the PGA Tour of Australasia, where he is an Order of Merit winner, which, if I am correct, Tom, he's going to have a full status card next year on the, the DP World Tour. So he's going to get what Michelouzi. He's going to get what Michelouzi has gotten, which is, again, terrible in the sense that he's got to wait nine months <laughs> to to be able to, to do that and capitalize on it when he won three out of four starts. Um pretty much once turning pro uh, he missed his only two cuts on the DP world tour that he's played. That kind of gives me a little bit of hesitation showing up here for it. Um, I, I liked, I liked golfers that you mentioned, uh, I guess, pre-show somebody um, what's it? It's uh Rahil game game Ganji, right? Ganji. Somebody now, Ganji has been somebody who, in which 46 years old, has been kind of a lifetime PGA Tour of India golfer. Now he finished second on the Challenge Tour last week, 22nd the week before, third and second prior to that. Opened at a thousands at a book in the States, got immediately cut. Um, I think it was a mistake. Should be around the hundreds, which makes sense there. But um, if I am correct, Ganji's best performance was not at the DP World Tour. No. Right, it was on a PJ Tour of India one. Yeah. That, um, that that was the pause. The fact that you, you know you, you look into him more and he's forty six and he's been a career kind of PJ Tour of India golf and never actually really even stepped up to the challenge level. Right, and actually he's he's played here four times and one of them was in the Indian Open event and he shot seventy six eighty one and then he's played here on the PJ Tour of India second, thirty second, and twenty second. Now, what what's weird about that guy is like. It's all professional golf, right? So suddenly to go so bad and to, and to shoot the, the kind of number the numbers that he shot on his debut in the DP World Tour of seventy six eighty one, was he just out of form? You know, it doesn't sound realistic that that's the sort of scores he would shoot even even at a higher level, right? It's not like it's extended five hundred yards or something like that. So um, I would be tempted by by Ganji if if, um, you know, if it came up. Yeah, for, for me, there was two golfers specifically um, that thrived at the DP World Tour Hero Indian Open and then have flashed form going into this year's event. Um, first one being v- Veer Alawat. So Veer, um, I saw Brad and Michael both put him up too. If you go on the DP World Tour site, 
players list their home course. Veer is one of two golfers who list this this course as his home course. Veer finished fifth last week at the Challenge Tour uh, event, so a little bit trending for him. He was 13th in the in the dual event, um, which you'd probably say is his best career performance when you look at where he's basically played. Uh, I mean, last year he also was seventh in an Asian Tour event, ninth in another, 11th in a Challenge Tour event too. So some pops, but he was inside, he was fourth going into the final round last year um, and hadn't even really been showing much form heading into the event. So Veer, last I checked, we can find him. He's 300 to one um, at a book here. He's 100 with the each way, 200 at, at 365 uh, if you want five spots. So I think 300 for Veer. Going back, that route is one for me, Veer Alawat, A-H-L-A-W-A-T. And then the other golfer who played incredibly well in the Hero Indian Open 2. At the halfway point, he was second. After 54 holes, he was seventh. Sunday didn't go his way. But Engad Chima, C-H-E-E-M-A. Um, so Engad was right in the mix. And then if you look at his re- lead-in form, eighth, 36, third, 14th his last four events. So finished 20th there. Those two guys, I mean, they were the clear standouts when it came to PGA Tour of India players last year at this event. And then coming into now this year with form, it isn't the SSP Charasia kind of form or what we've talked about, but you made a good point in saying like he did have at least a bunch of DP world tour success and led in when he dominated at this event. Um, So these guys have the best performance that they could have put on basically without, you know, basically placing um, last year and still get some deep numbers. Yeah. hundred percent. And just to clarify those, those rounds I read out there for um, Ganji were actually Manu Gandis's finishes here. There's actually the next person down. So actually Ganji had, it's still a pretty similar story. Like he missed the cut. He shot 72, 84 here in the Indian open. And then the, the next time he did play this in the open, he shot 77, 80 over the weekend when he did make the cut. So similar sort of story, but not not the picture I was completely painting. So Manu Gandas might be the one that, you know, so someone you mention a lot. That's the next one that I wanted to get yeah. to. So I was going to say, I remember like, like I was waiting to bet Galetti this type of week. I, I couldn't wait to bet Manu Gandas for this event last year. He had finally made his first cut on the the dp world tour event the week before and then he made it i think he finished 20th or maybe 22nd last year and he probably opened like 300s 400s i mean i was betting him deep into it i mean he was doing the the gucks and shen he was doing the the kaburi he was doing that recipe of racking up wins on the tour now with dlf experience he's got a second place here as well on the pj tour of india too and we're getting a number on Gondas, you know, like his form isn't as good as the other two guys, but his pedigree is much stronger. I say form isn't as good. He's 26, miscut fifth, 13th. And then he did win six weeks ago on the PGA tour of India. And last I saw Gondas, if we look at the numbers here, Gondas 300 uh, is the deepest number we have here in the States. Um, so I, I'm for sure going to bet him. Those, those are the three guys that I feel like coming over in the PGA tour of India Let's, you know, I mean, I always shoot for the moon and think we can get a win, but, you know, top five, top 10 on those guys, I, I really, really like it this week. Yeah, 30 second Gandas was at this event last year in 20 second okay. on, the, on the the PJ Tour of India event that he'd finished second out the year before. So, yes, that's um, what it was. but yeah, so the open with a 70 here last year in this Indian Open event, he was eighth after round one, 18th after round two. And look, I think when you look at scores and they go 70, 73, 73, 73 74, you think it's a bad week, but that's not horrendous here like it's one thing you've got you've got to really pay attention to is that you know it's anything 72 or better is really good around here and then you kind of expect a kind of 73 74 from more different types of players so the fact that it was gandas is you know a young age is is absolutely fine so yeah uh, a lot of information to digest there with the indian guys but um hopefully there's some names there for people to pick up from. totally agree i think i think basically i'm just just not uber confident in the top or or mid range. I mean, what I got four selections that are triple digits. I mean, it's not a surprise the way I bet often on this tour. But um, yeah, I, I'm excited to to kind of roll up with those guys. Um, anybody else to roll through? Or are you cool with reviewing betting cards? I think that that's probably it. I, th- I think if 
I did look at Angel Hidalgo, someone that I kind of mentioned a couple of weeks ago, play well. He's, he's kind of up there in um, a couple of key categories for me. I couldn't get there. I think Hugo Casar is going to get forget, forgotten about quite quickly and probably shouldn't do. Um, he's the same thing with Scott in the sense that yeah. I don't think it's a good course fit, but man, I mean, he's got so many bogeys, but he birdied so many holes. He should have finished better than he did last week. 100%. And the other one, Sky, I don't, and this is always the argument of, is it just because of where they've been playing? But Daniel Van Tonder's in some really good form. Yeah, yeah. Like, he, he's playing really strongly. Uh, 10th, 27th, 20th, 9th, 7th. And, of course, it suits him. They've played the DP World Tour in uh, South Africa, and he's gone back to the, the, the Sunshine Tour when he's not been playing here. But, um, you know, he's, he has played. He's got played this golf course. He finished, I think, 56th here last year. It wasn't, it wasn't great, but he had a really bad final round. I, I could see him playing quite well. He, um, when I think about like where he played the best of his life was that PJ championship. That was incredibly hard. Maybe a hard test suits him. Um, Ugo also won on the challenge tour in India too. Kusab did. He won one of these, those coach action events last year. Um, I didn't need much more encouragement to beat him. So that might be a, we'll, we'll review that as the week goes on. If I, if I do it, then I'll tweet it out. Yeah, the only other guy that I thought I saw, um, Om, what's it, Om Prakish, he had won one of those events too. Om Prakish Chahun, good, he was eighth last week. He just never kicked on after basically doing what Gondas did in 2022 on the PGA Tour of India. He did that in 2023, has some success here. Uh, I am passing, but um, I, I think we're ready to review. Man, I have five selections that are triple digits, Tom. This is fun. This is good. This is a good way. Let me go. Let me go through mine, and then we can we can put out the big hitters. So, uh, yeah. burnt these burgers. There's still a 30 to one at the moment, but it's probably gonna be like 25 to one by the time you listen to this. Uh, Matthias Schwab at 70 to one. Simon Forsham 110 to one. And Darius Van Drill 130 to one. Now with Forsham and Van Drill, if you want places, you're looking at kind of like 66 and 80 to one respectively on those guys. Um, but yeah, like them all. Perfect. All right. So. We align on those top two, right? We have burned at 25 is now the best in the States. I'm still very okay with that. Vandriel's getting cut a little bit over here, but they're still without the places. A hundred to one. Galetti 150 with the six places. There's 220, 250s without it. I'll probably honestly end up betting a lot of separate guys this week because it looks like the each ways aren't the best um, over here in the States, at least for this week. Um, Veer Alawat, he's 300 to one as long as so A-H-L-A-W-A-T, find him. Manu Gandis at 300 to one as well. And then wrapping up at the end, is a, it's a super bomb, I guess we could say. Um, Angad Chima is 750 to one this week. So uh, that's just some, some really long shots that, at least from the context of what we like this week, I think that we get one if not two of those guys in the top 10 it, that's still a a winning week in that manner when you're betting um this this deep down the board so a winner plus that time how about how, how about that yeah it's got a winner and a big bomb right like i think i think that's the next stage is to get one of these kind of big that's probably our next evolution guys get one of your 750 to one winners through the post um that would be pretty exciting but look i think i think ultimately we i think we're on alignment in terms of what we expect from the golf course uh, i like the picks that we've landed on um, you're going to have to kind of take the take the hits with the Indians. I, that, that's not me. I, I, I think I'm uh, I'm just nodding and agreeing. But um, yeah, I, th- I think it's going to be a good week, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. it. Should be a really good watch, um, if nothing yeah. else. So looking forward to it. Yep, hundred percent. It's like we mentioned at the top. We have a, a gap in the schedule. I think April 18th is the next time uh, the DP World Tour. So it's the week after the Masters. So it should be a three week break here for us, or two week break. Um, but thank you as always, Tom appreciate all your your efforts uh that we go through with this and let's uh let's keep the ball rolling yes get another winner yep amen awesome good luck everybody we'll catch you soon thanks 